So uh, I like the idea of a universal basic income, but my concern is that if I got $1,000 more per month, that I would start consuming more. And it seems like with capitalism, and you've mentioned economic growth quite a bit, it seems that it always comes at the expense of the environment, and there's a need for us as a society to consume less. And so is there any way that you've kind of coupled that to uh, your framework as, as a person running for president? Yeah, what's, what's your name? Uh, my name's Daniel. Daniel, that's such a great question. Uh, and so first let me say that I think climate change is the second existential threat facing us. It's like 1A. It's like right in parallel. It's in tandem with uh, uh, the automation of jobs and the dehumanization of our economy. Now, I'm going to suggest that these two things are linked. Because if you go to people and say, hey, we need to worry about climate change, a significant proportion of them in a country where 57% of people can't pay an unexpected $500 bill and 78% are living paycheck to paycheck, a significant proportion of them will say, I can't pay my bills. The penguins can wait in line. Or something obnoxious like that. And, and that's just human nature. Because if you can't pay your bills, you actually have your head down. Like big societal level, future oriented problems are not your concern. You get increasingly disengaged. You have what's called a mindset of scarcity, which has been shown to decrease your functional IQ by 13 points or one standard deviation. And then collectively, we have a much lower chance of actually activating around something like climate change. So what we do is we take the economic boot off of people's throats and then say, hey, we need to address climate change. And then more of them will get on board because they'll say, yes, yes, we do. Now, to your concern that we're going to consume more and it's going to cause more, uh, you know, I'm optimistic, and we'll see how this bears out, is that if you had a portable income of this kind, you'd have also more people embracing minimalism and communal living and going to places where they can have like a community garden and work on their like art that they've always wanted to. Like you'd have some things going in both directions. But the other thing is I want to actually measure economic progress as I indicated before. GDP is an archaic measurement we made up almost 100 years ago. And even the inventors said this is a terrible measurement for national well-being and we should not use it as that. And so I was suggesting before that GDP is going to guide us astray. So what would guide us more appropriately would be something that integrates human health, childhood success rates, and environmental quality. You actually make it that economic progress is tied to uh, environmental sustainability. And then if you grow, you're growing in the way that you actually want to. Because right now we're growing in this two-dimensional way that's going to kill us, and it's going to kill the planet. So what we have to do is we have to evolve to a 21st century economy that actually is driving things that would help us. And that definitely includes clean air, clean water, and environmental sustainability. Uh, hi, I'm an, <clears throat> I'm an American immigrant that actually now lives in Brussels in Belgium, and I've been living in the European uh, model for the last four or five years, and there's lots to be learned over there, imported over. But And one of the things that's uh, in the conversation there, and it's in the conversation in America as well, if you're paying attention, The Atlantic did a cover article on it too, about a year and a half ago, which is just the end of work period as a concept um, in the first world. All the first world economies are up, productivity is off the scale. Um, Scandinavian countries are going back, going to a four-day work week and a seven-hour work day, sometimes a six-hour work day. Is there that what's is, happening to you, man? The no, Chicago I'm a writer, now. man. I just I, I work five jobs at a time minimum. <laughs> I haven't, I, and I've been doing it for 20 years. So that's yeah. the. But it is for to be honest with you, I have a lot of people who are in the corporate world who look at me and want to make my 25,000 euros a year minimum because I have a certain kind of freedom because I'm not tied to that sort of economic model. But there are a lot of people thinking about first world economies moving towards this concept of end of work, which is deeply related to, obviously, also decoupling your worth as a noun. I am a writer, for instance, or I am a truck driver, or I, I work, and so therefore I have value. Just, and this may be you know, 10, 10 years down the line, but do you have any comments on that concept as a whole, the end of work in the first world? Yeah, so no, unfortunately there's been this massive divergence. So uh, Keynes predicted that we'd have 15 hour work weeks because our productivity would just keep going up. Um, yeah, and you guys are laughing because instead we have like endless work weeks mm -hmm. where it's like, I sent you a text at like 11.30, why didn't you get back to me? And, um, so what happened in America is that our work week got shorter until about 1980 mm -hmm. and then it reversed and got longer and longer and that's where it is now. Mm -hmm. Um, so in America you have this divergence where people in various roles are actually working longer hours than ever. 
and then other people are just not working at all. Uh, and, and so would America benefit from curbing some of the excesses in terms of corporate work culture? 100% yes. I mean, studies have shown that a lot of those incremental hours are not actually adding much productivity. Right. Yeah. Um, but will that happen in the absence of some re regulation? Will people just you know, sort of move in that direction? Unfortunately, the facts point the other direction in the US, where like, the workism, um, you know, always on culture is actually uh, getting stronger. And so as president, would I want to try and curb that? Would I say, look, maybe we should move towards four day work weeks for cer certain industries, uh, make it so that there are like, uh, you know, times of uh, the day when like you should not be always on and that companies like should not expect most employees to like be available for like 16 hours a day and the rest of it? Yeah, I would. Um, but it's not going to happen on its own because unfortunately the dynamics of this economy make it that a lot of corporates will just demand more and more of workers until we drop dead. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to change the topic a little bit because you're not a one note wonder um, and have, oh, I know, well, a you. whole slate of um, policy proposals that are quite specific. Um, and I know one of them is that you're not in favor of uh, free college. Um, and I'm really curious about what you think about public education K through 12. Um, and what you think about the crisis of student loan debt, what your proposals are around both of those things, and also um, education in general, which seems essential to our civic health. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I have 75 policy proposals on my website, so it's like UBI and then like 74 others. So um, th th that's what she was referring to, I, I think, in part. Um, I love the spirit of free college or free public college. I just think that it sends the wrong message because um, college, so the first thing is that only 32% of Americans graduate from college and that proportion has essentially been constant for years. And then as we've tried to plow more people into college, what we've done is we've brought down the college completion rate. Um, the college completion rate in six years now is 59%. Um, so 41% of people who are starting college do not finish within six years. And so selling college as a panacea um, is just not going to work. A and it's subsidizing something that's enjoyed by the top third of the population, which may or may not be the direction you want to go. So to me, you're much better off uh, putting a thousand bucks a month into everyone's hands and saying, if you want to use that to partially pay for college, that's great. If you want to pay for vocational, which we should be massively investing in, that would be great too. If you want to do something independent, maybe you want to start something, like that would be a better way to go. Um, and it's in tandem with the fact that we have this educational school loan crisis in this country where it's up to $1.5 trillion. Uh, why has college gotten two and a half times more expensive over the last 25 years? It has not gotten two and a half times better. Uh, and so the reason is that they've just invested in a lot of non-faculty administrators. And so you have to separate out the different problems. Has college gotten too expensive? Yes. Saying, are we going to subsidize and have free college as a solution? Uh, to, to me, it's a little bit too much in one way and not enough in another. So what you do is you go to colleges and you say, look, why are you so expensive? You got to get your costs down and you got to get your administrator to student ratios down to what they were in the 90s. And if you don't, you don't get school loans. And then the universities would say that's impossible. And then you'd be like, well, I have a feeling you'll figure it out. Uh, and then they would. And, uh, and then they would find that it impacts the student experience. Not at all. Because at this point, the, these schools are like a massive crushing debt burden. It's like a tax on our economy. Um, how many of you all have student loan debt? You all look kind of young, some of you. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, you don't need to be young to have student loan debt. I had 100000 in school loans myself. Um, I, I used to call it my mistress because I was like writing a check to like a family in another, another part of the country. I was like. So it's immoral. I would forgive a lot of that student loan debt um, uh, in an argument for stimulus because young people and like <laughs> Other people should be starting families, buying homes, starting businesses, and not paying off this phantom school debt that, you know, like was for an education they got years ago and the school was already paid. It's purely a financial invention at this point. And so if you wanted to make an economy that worked for people, you'd just be like, look, this is a great stimulus to the economy. Let's just like get some of the school loan debt off of people's backs, get colleges more to be more cost efficient and then give everyone $1,000 uh, a month and invest very highly in vocational. Because right now only 6% of American high school students are in vocational or, or technical tracks. In Germany that's 59%. What do you all think the appropriate percentage is for America then? 25 or 30, 25 or 30 right? 
but the problem is we're overselling college to all these kids. We're like, hey, if you don't go to college, your life is over. Uh, and then they go to college, they get this debt. Even if you come out of college right now, you know what the underemployment rate is for recent college grads? It's 44 percent. So again, this entire like subsidized free college, like it doesn't solve the problem. Like if you come out and you're underemployed and you don't have crushing debt, yeah, that's better than having crushing debt. Um, but like maybe we need to start trying to address the imbalances in our system. And one of the imbalances is that we're over prescribing college, we're under supporting vocational trades and apprenticeships. Because if you're going to automate away a lot of the jobs, which we are, 44% of the jobs in America are either repetitive manual or repetitive cognitive. We're going to automate away a ton of those jobs. But you know what's really hard to automate away? Repair. Yes, air conditioning repair, <laughs> plumbing. You know, like it's very, very hard to, to automate away fine motor work like that. Those jobs are steady, they pay well, they're, they're gratifying. So we need to start saying to kids, like, that's a really good way to go. Like, that's a better way to go than a four year degree that might, you know, that just might lead you nowhere. No offense, I went to college, you know, I love college and all that, but, um, but we're just overselling it. So it's a very long winded answer to a complex set of issues, but that, that's, it's a multi pronged problem. Sure. All right, I want to preface this question by saying I don't know too much about UBI, but um, I'm enthusiastic about the concept. In my limited research, I came across two big criticisms, which I just want to shoot by you. And sure. See, yeah. Um, so what do you say to those who argue that giving everybody $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month would allow businesses to raise the price of goods and services and create a new social like norm? Yep. Or allow businesses to reduce wages and subsidize those reduced wages with this income, similar to how Walmart um, encourages employees to be on food stamp programs and such. Yeah. So if you look at our experience as consumers, uh, we have not had massive inflation in any category but three. Education, which we discussed, healthcare, which has its own massive set of problems, and so I'm for Medicare for all and just getting like the cost down and the access up because there's no other way to do it. There's just so many excesses in that system. And then housing. Um, so if you look at your consumer experiences with clothing or electronics or media or cars or even food for the most part, prices have been more or less stable. And so if I put money into your hands, all of the markets where it's a free-floating consumer economy with price sensitivity and competition among firms, you would not see massive price gouging. If McDonald's decided to double the price of its hamburger, like after we all had a thousand bucks a month, um, you'd just be like, wow, I guess I'm going to go to Taco Bell or you know, the deli. Um, and then they'd all have to gouge you simultaneously. And then it just takes one of them to say, I'm not going to gouge. And then they get all the business and then all the prices come back down. It's not like if you have a thousand bucks a month, you're all of a sudden like made of money. You know, it's like you, you still are going to be bargain hunting. Um, and so that's true across all of the functional markets that you know, competition and technology apply to. It's really the dysfunctional markets that are driving us crazy. And putting money into people's hands will actually allow us to manage that inflation um, as opposed to cause it. Because this inflation is not being driven by purchasing power. In terms of the worker bargaining power, it's actually the inverse. Uh, so check this out. Let's say everyone's getting a thousand bucks a month and then Walmart decides it's going to exploit people. It's going to be like, I'm going to pay you nothing. You have to work for free. Then people would be like, of course I'm not going to do that. And I know I cannot starve to death if you don't give me something that's actually worth my while. It's possible Walmart might actually have to increase their pay. What you might, you might see is you might see people that are frankly very unpleasant employers um, might have to actually pay more because at this point people know they can survive without a job that they hate. Um, and so you'd, you'd see um, wages change in different fields. There are some fields where they probably could get away with paying less, but we might find that to be okay. For example, nonprofits or like teaching and coaching jobs or some, some other jobs, they might be like, hey, we need more people, we'll pay you a little less and then people might be cool with that because they're like, I kind of want to do that work. And then the really um, soul crushing jobs would actually have to pay more. So it, it's not a uniform impact. Um, it, it would vary, but it, the big thing to think about is that it improves our bargaining power. It makes us actually more exploitation proof, not exploit a bull. Thanks. Um, I'm interested in kind of two things. One is your definition of intrinsic value 
And then I'm also interested in how would you plan to educate people on the concept of intrinsic value? If a truck driver can't be expected to become a coder, how can they be expected to become a part-time artist or an innovator? Yeah, so this is in many ways the fundamental challenge that we're facing is that people, actually no, men deal with idleness very, very poorly. Uh, if you're an unemployed man, you volunteer less than an employed man even though you have more time. And you spend up to 75% of your time on the computer playing video games and other things. And then your drug and alcohol consumption go up and your self-destructive behaviors also tend to go up. Um, women do not have these issues. Uh, women are never idle. Uh, they find various projects and pro-social, go back to school at higher levels, et cetera, et cetera. This is shocking to zero people in this room. <laughs> so, oh, so, and it's just facts. A very, very data-driven man. The opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> That's why I'm going to beat him in 2020. It's going to be glorious. So the, so the fundamental question is like what, how do we teach people intrinsic value, uh, to your point, where like if you're the truck driver who loses their jobs, $1,000 a month does not magically solve your problem. Like you need a sense of structure and purpose and fulfillment uh, and, and meaning. And so that is the fundamental challenge of this age, to introduce those things to millions of people as fast as we can. And these are some of like the deepest questions in human existence. Uh, and the way we get there, I have the answers in this book. No, I don't. I'm kidding. Um, like that, <laughs> it's called, <laughs> I was going to no, say something. Uh, no, sorry. That's a humor. Um, so the way we get there is we put this money into people's hands and then a significant amount of that money goes into nonprofits and civic organizations and religious organizations uh, and institutions that can help restore a, a set of opportunities that allow people to find structure, purpose, and meaning in their communities and their work. Um, so there's no easy answer. It's a generational struggle. Um, certainly when I think about intrinsic value, I think about my son who's autistic and I think like it's possible that he'll never actually have like the capacity to have like a normal job. Um, and so that's what I think of when I think of intrinsic values. So you look at the person, you know they're worth, you know, just as much as someone else. Um, but it's going to be a very, very difficult journey taking the current conventional market-driven American mindset and, and helping it move in that direction. Is there a generational gap in people that are more open to the idea of intrinsic value? So I think that the studies I've seen have indicated that young people are uh, more enthusiastic about socialism um, than capitalism, more enthusiastic about socialism than older generations. Um, and I think it's because many young people have seen the excesses and problems of capitalism over this last number of years. So I have a feeling that young people are more open to seeing people as having intrinsic value. I, I'd agree with that. Hi. My question dovetails pretty nicely with that, I think, which is that for me, I think the most resonant criticisms of UBI have revolved around the like spiritual and, and psychological value of work to an yep. individual. Um, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are and why you propose UBI versus, say, just a large jobs program with the same amount of money. Yeah. So, uh, so to me, work is central. Um, and the great thing about UBI is that it would create over two million jobs in these communities. And the example that I use is that if you can imagine a town in Missouri with 50,000 people, and right now there's someone in that town that wants to start a bakery, but the bakery is a dumb idea. Uh, but then I become president, and now there's another $50 million in spending power every month in that town, and then the bakery might become a good idea. And then that person starts a bakery, and then they say, hey, I need to hire a morning shift baker. And then you end up hiring people for accessible jobs in that community. Um, and that's only possible because you're supercharging the local economy and helping restore vitality to those Main Street retailers. So this isn't a, like, the, the easiest way is to say like, hey, what are the jobs that that community is going to value and support? Then people will do those jobs because work is central. The biggest misconception about UBI is that it somehow anti-work or mitigates work. It's pro-work. 
like it, it's pro work in terms of just creating jobs in those communities that people actually want to do and, and you know can access. It's also pro work in terms of like the moms and caregivers and nurturers because we know that's work too. It's just our market doesn't value it as that. So that's the big. Uh, it, you know, and, and that's at least starting to push us in the direction of meaning. How many of you all are entrepreneurs? So if you're an entrepreneur, you know what I'm talking about here, where it's like you're doing something primarily because it's important to you. Yes, there's money involved. Yes, it might seem like a good economic opportunity, but you're driven by the fact that you think that that form of work is the highest form of work you can be doing at this point. And so if you put more Americans in that position, then that ends up being like this incredible journey of self-discovery. Because what proportion of Americans right now do you think are doing like the job that they like, you know, really want to be doing? It, it's, so you said 20 percent, it's, it's like, uh, you said 25? Five, 30. Um, it's, it, I'm happy to say it's around 30. Um, but that still means there's like this incredible gulf in terms of our potential energy and value. So, you know, one of the joys about this is that you're going to end up creating t tens, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs, and then people will be able to define their own meaning. Um, I think a federal jobs guarantee program is well intended, but would be somewhere between problematic and disastrous in practice. Just like if you imagine a world where it's like, hey, there's no job for you. You're going to die of starvation, but don't worry. We've got this government job for you. And then you show up. And then let's say it's like you don't like the job. You don't like your boss. Like, you know, like that there are some problems. It's like, well, you don't have a choice because this is your only means of survival. Um, you know, and, and so then you wind up with this bureaucracy like doling out subsistence jobs that are necessary for people to survive. And then you have people get politically activated around that. Like this, this is a sure path to dystopia. And unfortunately, that seems to be the direction we're trending. Um, so I love the spirit of a federal jobs guarantee. If we could all magically have jobs that worked out and that we liked and that helped make the earth more sustainable, like that would be great. But in practice, that stuff is going to be very, very difficult and expensive and cumbersome and give rise to a whole new army of bureaucrats who will measure our performance. Hi. <clears throat> Ten minutes in terms of the whole thing? Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, all right, last question and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come down and say hello. So make it good. Sure. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, we, we all understand the importance of the tech industry for the future of work and how there's a huge potential for the, actually the tech industry fund the UBI dream, right? Like to actually bring it to life, um, especially with artificial intelligence. My question to you is, I never heard you talking about what did you do to actually keep US ahead of that AI development? Uh, and especially, how would you deal with China on that competition? Yeah. So for those of you who are into AI, um, the US and China are the two mega power leaders. Uh, and China is now poised to move ahead of us because they have more access to more data, which is like food for AI. And they also have an advantage that we do not have, which is they have a government that's willing to spend billions upon billions of dollars on limitless computing resource and infrastructure that they make available to their companies. I met with the leaders in AI in Silicon Valley not that long ago. And I said, hey guys, like, what's going on? And then they were like, hey, we're spending billions of dollars on uh, AI computing resources, but it's a small fraction of what China is spending. Uh, and so then I said, well, if I were president, would you like me to help with that? And they said yes. So the plan is for, <laughs> so, so the plan, so the, the ideal is to avoid an arms race dynamic um, because you don't want people like chasing after weaponized AI and, and thinking of it as a zero sum game. But in order to avoid that dynamic, the U.S. needs to be one of the strongest com countries. Uh, and so in order to keep that leadership, uh, we would need to invest meaningful public resources because even our richest private companies cannot compete with Chinese computing resources. I'm just going to tell a joke about AI because you know, I, I thought it was funny. Um, how far behind is China than the U.S. in AI? And, and the, the joke is 12 hours. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much for being here today. I just want to share something on the campaign. I'm poised to make the Democratic primary debates in June. 
Uh, and in order to make that happen, I need contributions from 65,000 individual Americans. And right now I'm at 50,000, I'm getting another 2,000 a day, so I'm gonna clear this threshold very, very easily. But if you'd like to be part of my making the debate stage, just make a donation at any point, and then, and then when I'm on the debate stage, you'd be like, hey, I helped make that happen. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. Would love to end this journey with you. Thank you.